Right, if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me tonight to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 4. Ephesians 4 and verse number 21. <clears throat> Title this message tonight, The Old Man versus the New Man. Ephesians 4, 21. <clears throat> if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Father, bless your word now. Thy holy name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Most of you know my testimony. I've given it enough, and I'm not ashamed at all uh, for what God's done for me, but he did it for me, and make no mistake. I've been saved now for 50 years. This past March, it's about 50, I was saved 1973. I lived for 27 years of my life, a pure lost hellion on this earth. Believe me, I was as sorry and low down as they come. There was never a day in my life when I felt uh, regret or remorse or conviction or sorrow over any of the filthy lifestyle that I was living, not a day. There was never any, never any, uh, uh, turmoil or any competition or any fighting or any kickback inside me. I was as dead inside as you could possibly be. Now that's my life. That's what I was until 1973. And but in 1973, I had an encounter with God. He came to me. And buddy, when I had an encounter with God, he changed my life completely and forever. And I became a new man in Christ. And at that moment, I didn't realize what I was in, getting into. I had no idea. I just knew I needed to be saved. And I was born again. And I accepted the Lord Jesus. And joy flooded my soul. And did it ever flood my soul. And for those today who mock the new birth, it's because you've never been born again yourself. You may be a good religious person. You may be a good moral person. You give people a shirt off of your back. That's all well and good. But if you're mocking the new birth, it's because you're screaming to high heaven. You know nothing about the new birth. The reason I'm in this house tonight is because I have been born again, been born of God. But it wasn't long after I was saved until I realized to my sorrow that that old Charles Lawson was still around. He was still around. Yes, he's still around. He was still around, still around. And the truth of the matter is, as I lived longer in my Christian life, I began to realize that what that old man Charles Lawson was, he still was. He was still as sorry and low down and godless and vile as he ever had been. The new birth in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, be born again, did not change him one bit. He's still vile and corrupt. Notice carefully what the apostle says in Ephesians 4, 22. You put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt. Did you see that? which, notice, didn't say was corrupt, is, present tense, present tense, is corrupt, and nothing changed. That's why the apostle could say, of all the sinners in the earth, I'm chief, I'm the chiefest of sinners, and he meant it when he said that, and according to the deceitful us, he said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the, it's, it's, it's one of the hardest things that Christians come to grips with, and that is that on one hand, you can love the Lord Jesus, and you can love the things of Zion. You can love the Spirit of God, the words, the Word of God, music. You want to be around God's people. You want to read the Bible. You want to pray. All these new things have come into your life. And on one hand, you view some of the things that you used to do. You say to yourself, how in the world could I have ever done that? But then on the other hand, you'll find yourself being tempted. You'll find yourself uh, regressing back into what the former man used to be. If you're not careful, and so therefore you, have, you take it upon yourself, you understand, now I'm in a battle, and you are. And you'll stay in it until you leave this world. So that's the battle of the two natures. And only saved people have two natures. Need to remember that. An unsaved man does not have two natures. He has one nature, and that is unsaved. He's lost without God. The apostle says in Colossians chapter number 3 and verse 8, 17, 8 through 17, 
But now you've also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you've put off the old man with his deeds. And now watch this. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now you can only put on the new birth one time. And that's really a misnomer. You don't put it on. The new birth is something the Holy Spirit does in your heart. That's the work of God, the new birth. And that's something that is eternal. It's fixed. It can't change. And it can't be taken away from you. The moment you're born again, you're born again forever. Hallelujah to God. He said in John, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. No man can pluck them from my hand. Amen. Thanks be unto God for that because you can reach a certain age in this world where dementia begins to set in. And your mind is not as sharp as it used to be. You lose your memory faculties. You lose a lot of things. And you may even lose uh, some, of the, some of the character and nature that you've been living under for 40, 50, 60 years. And you may revert back to some of the old man and some of that and, and begins to dominate your life. And this happens. They're talking about now under Alzheimer's, they're saying that there is a, that there is a symptom of Alzheimer's, which is a docile person, a gentle, sweet person, uh, can all of a sudden become v vicious and they can become, yeah, aggressive, and uh, and 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 their mouth can, uh, you know, can 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 give manifest the, the this this hate and anger that's going on inside their soul. So you got to keep that in mind. But and therefore you have to have the wisdom of God to understand that you don't judge a person by simply one encounter. And if unless you know what's going on, you need to understand these things. And and you know if you you talk to the family, talk to the doctor, talk to somebody, find out maybe this person is in the is in the advanced stages of Alzheimer's. Maybe there's some, maybe they had a lick in the head. Maybe it's, they something happened to them. And so you need wisdom when you're dealing with stuff like that. But here's the thing that you need to keep in mind: Has anything changed about the old man? Ask yourself that question tonight. That's that's that scares me because I know my old man. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be around that old man. No, Lord. <laughs> Lord, help us tonight. <laughs> you think I'd be up here in this pulpit preaching to you? Well, I'd be laying drunk somewhere. I probably wouldn't be. I'd been dead a long time ago. My liver would probably eat up with cirrhosis and died a drunk. But no, no. I know my old man. I know him. I know him good. The fact is, I know it. there's only one that knows my old man better than me. You know who that is, don't you? That's the Almighty. It scares me. Some of the stuff I did before I got saved. Yes, it does. I to think to myself, tonight you think I could possibly go back to that? Well, the old man would go back to it in a heartbeat. Yes, he would. Oh, no, no, preacher, no, just wait a minute. I think I've calmed the old man down and we've kind of sanctified him and, and we've cleaned him up and, and made him respectable. That's the thing about the old man. The old man's smart. The old man has a mind too. And the old man's been living with the new man for 50 years now, in this case. And he's learned an awful lot of Christian cliches. He knows an awful lot about the way churches operate. The old man's been there when, I, when the new man's reading the Bible, memorizing scripture. I suppose the old man memorized some scripture. You say, now wait a minute, preacher. What do you, makes you think the old man would memorize scripture? The devil did. You, 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 better, you better think about it tonight. How sorry and low down and godless and vile were you before you got saved? Well, your flesh still is. That's something to think about. The Bible said in Galatians 5, this I say, then walk in the spirit. So what does that mean? Well, I've given it to you ad nauseum, I guess, time and time and time and time and time again from 1 John chapter number 1. That the only way you can walk in the spirit is to admit three things. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you say you have not sinned, you make God a liar. That's fact. You remember those. You don't forget them. And in order to walk in fellowship with the Lord, which it says in 1 John chapter number 1, if we, if we have fellowship or walk in fellowship, we have with the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son cleanseth us from all sin, and we walk in light as He is in the light. We walk in fellowship. John chapter number 15, we abide in Him, 
regardless of whether we feel good or not, regardless of whether we think God's turned his back on us or not, regardless of whether we think we're complete and total failure. Truth of the matter is, folks, you are a failure. So I don't like to be talked to like that, preacher. Well, you are, folks. He's able to hold me up. Amen. He holds me. He is able to keep that which I've committed to him. Amen. I am a failure, folks. I'm no good. From the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, there's no soundness in me. But oh, how I know the one that gave me a new man. And that's what I'm talking about tonight. It's the battle between the old man and the new man. And folks, it's a, it's, it's a war of attrition. It's not two powerful armies meeting on a battlefield and one leaves victorious over the others and other and enjoys the spoils of war. This is attrition. What's that mean? That means that they hide in the bushes and they stand on the wayside and they attack the army from the rear and they come back and attack again and attack again and there's never, there never is a real victory. Uh, there never is a complete victory over the, the war of attrition. That's what's happened to Israel now for all of its time. Attrition. That's the way Satan fights. He likes that. He likes to fight <clears throat> the war of attrition. He snipes at you, he bites at you, cuts at you, digs at you. Then he'll back off for a little while and then he'll come back again. Here he comes. And he changes his tactics. And he learns. He tries you. He's smart. He knows, what, he knows how to push your buttons. He knows how to reach you. He knows how to get down into, you, into what makes you tick. <clears throat> and then he can get real religious. Oh my, you can pray and you can be talking to the Lord. <laughs> I was talking to the Lord the other day and all of a sudden this voice spoke right in. I said, you're the devil if I ever heard him. He spoke right in when I was talking to the Lord and sweetness and fellowship with the Lord. How many of you know what I'm talking about with sweetness and fellowship with the Lord? There's nothing like that, folks. He's talking to the Lord and he's talking to you and you're reading his word and you're getting strength from it and you know you are. When I was on that back porch over there, I came back from Israel and the devil tried to kill me at the Kidron Valley. I'll never forget that battle, and I told you about it, but I was sitting on that back porch two or three o'clock in the morning, and my goodness, the Holy Ghost came down upon me. He moved in my soul like I'd never had him move in my soul in the power of the Spirit. I sat down on that swing, and it's just like the floodgates were open. All of this just started pouring into me about the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and nothing is done without the Holy Spirit of God. Anything that is attempted to be done Without the Holy Ghost is dead works. That's all it is. It may be good works. It may be good moral works. It may be needful works. But it's still dead. The Holy Spirit must give it life. He must animate it. He's got to give it life. So therefore you have to have the Holy Spirit. So the apostle says, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now do you think he's talking to unsaved people here? Of course not. He's talking to saved. And here's what he says. He says, the flesh lusteth after the spirit. In plain words, the flesh wants the mind of the spirit. That's what it's trying to capture the mind. That's what that word lust means. I believe it's epithemio, but I don't remember. It doesn't matter. It tries to reach up and take hold of the thought processes. You see, your mind, folks, your mind is a spiritual entity that can go in either direction. The mind can be the mind of Christ where you're, you're, you're in humility and you're walking fellowship and you give of yourself and it's not about you. Or it can be the mind of the flesh. It can be me, myself, and I. I'll take. It's me. It's about me. That's the mind of the flesh. And so they battle. The battle for the mind is probably the greatest battle that you'll ever endure in this world. The battle, it didn't say the battle of the brain. The brain is an organ. I'm talking about something that rises to a level higher than the brain. The mind uses the brain, but the mind is a spiritual entity. Keep that in mind. That's important. It's a spiritual entity. And so therefore the Bible said, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary the one to the other. There's no, there's no mutual ground. There's no uh, meeting of the minds. There's no place of dialogue. There's no place of where you can sit down and come to an agreement and, and hammer out some kind of a solution, it doesn't work. The flesh wants it all. It wants every bit of it. It wants to take over your life. Remember, whatever you used to be before you got saved is sitting there right with you right now. And it's quite a thing. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Now watch what the apostle says here in Galatians 5. 
He said they're contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. You have a peace in your heart and things that you want to do for the Lord. But then you'll also find how that this, this mind, this other mind, uh, becomes a hindrance. But if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, and he lists them, all these works are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of, the which I tell you bef of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past. Now note carefully that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, who's he talking to, folks? Let's get this back in context. Is he preaching to a bunch of lost people on Hayboy Corner? Is he talking to Christians? Or at least he's talking to people who profess Christ. So what are you trying to say? I'm, here's what I'm trying to say to you. How you live is important. Because how you live directly manifests the spirit that you're living by. That's it. How you live is important. Well, somebody said, I'm doing the best I can. Thank God for eternal security. Don't put your hope on eternal security. You'd better put your hope in Christ. Never put your hope in a doctrine. Put your hope in a person. The, amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only one I take hold of. And I'm very careful about some of these things because, believe it or not, <laughs> My old man would like to get off into adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, so forth and so on. Would yours? Well, of course it would. Because that's what it lives for. You see, there's a nuance here. So what's that mean? That means that there's a thing here that's kind of, that, that's not so quick to, to manifest itself. And yet, if you look a little deeper into it, you begin to see where the Apostle Paul is saying, I know you Galatians. I know you. You've got people who came in here that said that, oh, the grace of God's fine, Christ died for you. But you also need to keep the law of Moses. You need to be circumcised. You need to keep the Sabbath day and all of this. You see, they were Judaizers. Galatians is full of Judaizers. The apostle Paul said to them, who hath bewitched you? Who bewitched you? In plain words, what witch cast a spell on you? Now, that's quite a thought, isn't it? So I don't think that could happen to a Christian. What's he talking about? <laughs> See what I mean? Who bewitched you? Here's the thing. Be very careful, dear friend, if you unleash a demon. Be very careful when you unleash a demon because it may come back and consume you. Be very careful. Be very careful. Wish no ill on anyone. <laughs> no, don't do that. Wish no ill on any soul. And you, if, if, you, if you start wishing hurt and ill on people, it's because you haven't suffered enough and you haven't seen enough of it in this world. And brother, and I've seen a bunch of it. Oh, Lord, have I ever seen sorrow and suffering? My, my, could do me a thousand lifetimes. Wish no ill. Pray for them. Wish God's blessing. Pray for blessing upon people, upon each other. Comfort one another. Support each other. Bear each other's burdens. Love one another. You'd be surprised at how if you begin to unleash the power of real love, what it'll do for you. But the Apostle Paul warns them in Galatia. He says, oh, I know you make professions about all that you believe. But here's what Peter said about it. He said, it's happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog, okay, returns to his vomit. The sow to her wallowing in the mire. A sad. You see, if I did not have the Spirit of God with me tonight, and everything got dark, and there was nowhere to turn, and I thought he'd shut heaven up to me, and there's no hope. Where would I go? What would you do? How long could you hold out until heaven opened again, until you heard from him again? How long could you go? Sometimes God lets it get dark so you can see the light. Sometimes he lets you feel alone so you'll appreciate his presence. And it happens to us. He teaches us the hard way sometimes. And sometimes the lessons you have to learn can only be learned the hard way. Amen. The hard way. The hard way. So he said, uh, 
Be careful. You may profess this, but if this is the way you live, fornication, adultery, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, so forth and so on, you're not going to heaven, he said. You're not going to heaven. It's a manifestation that you're walking in the flesh, of the flesh, and you don't know the Lord. In other words, it's put in here so you could examine yourselves. If a man says he's a Christian, he's a brother, or she is a Christian, she is a sister, you don't have to tell me you're not perfect. That's a waste of breath. Nobody's perfect. And do we sin? Yes, we sin. But what happens to us? As long as it grieves you, and as long as it bothers you, enough to go to the Lord with it and ask for forgiveness and strength and wisdom and discernment to know how to walk in fellowship with the Lord. Teach me your way. Teach me your voice. Teach me, Lord. I want to learn these things. I wasn't born with them. It doesn't come naturally. This fellowship in the Spirit is one of the most blessed things there is. But you need to know it. It's something that can be learned, but it has to be learned the hard way. Now let me give you some lessons that I've learned in life. I've, I've learned a few things. You know, I didn't want to get in all technical tonight about, and there's so many scriptures I could cover, but I want to make points. I want to make, I want to make real points tonight that you can take home and you can think on them. Now, I told you, I've made a point tonight, and, and I hope you're, you, you, I don't think you're going to forget it, that your old man that's sitting there listening to me tonight is the same old man that was there when you got saved. That old man is just the same. He hasn't changed a bit. So... Here's the first thing I would counsel you to do if I possibly could walk in fellowship. That's first. That's primary. That's like reading. If you remain illiterate, you talk about being handicapped. And there, some are, and that's a sad thing. It's fundamental. To walk in fellowship with the Lord, that's fundamental. That's Christianity. That's Christ. We've got to have that fellowship. We've got to have our time alone with God. You've heard me say I start in the morning early. I'm up there. I'm talking to him. I want to talk to the Lord. Every once in a while I look up at these stars and I think to myself, good night, how far is that star from me? How much is up here? And yet that being that created all of that is right here on this porch talking to me. <laughs> Fellowship with him. I urge it in the morning or whatever time that you can pick in the day. Somebody, everybody can't do it in the morning. But whatever works for you, that's what's important. Start tomorrow. Talk to him. Tell him you want to talk to him. Tell him you want fellowship with him. Tell him, tell him, say, Lord, help me. Teach me these spiritual truths. I need to learn them. I need to know them. And then open his word and begin to read it. Read his word. Ask him, Lord, where do you want me to read the word? You might not want to start with so-and-so begets so-and-so who begets so-and-so who begets so-and-so. That's the Bible. It's good that it's in there. But it might not be the best place to start. So-and-so begets so-and-so who begets so-and-so. <laughs> but there's a lot of places in the Bible that he'll take you to to start reading. And uh, it'll be good. And here's the second thing that I would counsel you, to, counsel you to renew your mind. What, are, what, are you con what do you think about all day long? You remember Fanny Crosby's song? It's over here. I think of him all day long. That's what Fanny said. And I believe her. I think of him all the time. And after a while, you begin to relate everything to him. The truth of the matter is, everything has its identity and its existence as it relates to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things. Number three, learn the power of wicked spirits. Learn them. Learn the power of wicked spirits. They're liars. They're deceivers. They can pose as the Holy Spirit. They're persuasive and unrelenting. They're very resilient. You think you've got them licked on one hand and they can come back in another form in another way. These wicked spirits, have you come to torment us before the time? We know who thou art. You're the Holy One of God. You're the Son of God. Is that true? Of course it's true. Of course it's true. And of course, they had their motive for saying that. You say, preacher, would wicked spirits, are they still around today? It depends on what Theology 101 you got. But I'm telling you the truth. Some of, these, some of these churches today are so, what's the word for it? I'm telling you. Uh, sanitized. That's it. Sanitized. 
that every word has to be run through a filter <laughs> and packaged and fed out to the people. And it has to meet a certain agenda. And here's, I'm serious. If the Bible agrees with their agenda, good for the Bible. But if the Bible does not agree with their agenda, out with the Bible. There are people like that today. Make no mistake about it. Learn the power of the blood. I told you I confronted an evil spirit the other day. I can't see the blood. Neither did any of those Israelites in Egypt uh, 3,400 years ago. Did they see the blood, but they knew it was there. You know it's there, folks? Don't ever let anybody tell you. Don't ever let anybody. They are so, one day they're going to be embarrassed to death. There are preachers out there teaching people that when the Bible talks about the blood of Christ, he entered in one with his own blood into the presence of, they're simply, that's simply a type of his life that he lived. No, sir. It's the blood of Christ that is the witness in heaven and it is there. And my dear friend, Revelation 1, 5 says, he hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yeah, yeah. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. Learn the power of the blood. They know what the power of the blood is. They're defeated by the blood and they can't cross the barrier of the blood. I said to you, unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave me. Leave me. You have no claim to me. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And after a while, you know, you, I mean, how many of you would like to spend one more night with the frogs? Raise your hand. <laughs> Pharaoh did. One more night with the frogs. <laughs> Sad thing is, he didn't know what was coming. Did he? He lost his firstborn. He lost his son. He didn't know what was coming. Do you know why? He took on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Learn the power of sin. All right, now listen carefully to me. Does it change its nature because it is in a Christian? Hmm? Mm -mm. No. You are still, that old man is still what he has always been. God did not save the old man. He was not born again. He created a new man. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he saved your soul, wrote your name, Lamb, Book of Life. In plain words, the power, the wickedness, the vileness, and the nature of sin does not change even if a Christian is committing it. Now that's a point to think about. Why should it? Is it not sin? Yes. Is sin a spiritual thing? Yes. Yes. It has far more power being a spiritual thing that gives birth to physical than any other way. Well, then, since we don't know the essence of a spirit, do we? We don't. Then we really don't know the full essence of sin. I've been scratching around that and praying over it for some time, and I don't have a complete answer with it. But I do know that it is in rebellion, it is anti-God, it is anti-Christ, it is wicked and it is vile, and its very substance is death. Sin is death. And when it finished, it, everything it touches dies. So what about a Christian? Death. In 1 John chapter 5, he said, if you see a brother sinning a sin unto what? Death. Sin is a killer. Think of it like that. It kills. So the nature of sin hasn't changed one bit. Now, do you have anything in your, that you've done this week? Well, you say, preacher, I'm telling you the truth. I just can't think of anything. Well, let me tell you what you're trying to think with. Okay? See, this is the key. You're trying to think with a mind that may very well be on the left-hand side, a mind that is attached to the power of Satan and you're also trying to think about whether you've committed some sin or not by a heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it see don't trust your mind and your heart to be right with God trust his word and sincere honest prayer and pray till you get an answer pray till you get an answer if you're doing something and you're not sure what it is, don't come to the preacher about it. Don't ask me to tell you with it. 
Because it's right or wrong. Talk to God. Talk to the Lord. Talk to God. Keep talking to him. He'll answer you. He wants to walk in fellowship with you. He certainly does. So learn the power of sin. Does it change its nature because it is in a Christian? No, no. And then finally, consider thyself also. Galatians 6, if you, you know, have a brother taken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, uh, kick him out the back door. Shun him. What's it say? Restore. Restore. You know, folks, that ought to be an exciting ministry for somebody. They ought to say to themselves, you know, I'm not a preacher and I'm not a missionary and thank God for our preachers and thank God for our missionaries, but everybody's got their place. You may be a restorer. You may be one who can intercede because intercession would certainly be definitely, uh, I would consider a qualifications to be someone to restore. You could restore that person. It may take, some while. It may take a while. You may have to win their confidence. You may have to win them over to the simple fact that they, that they trust that what you're saying is for their benefit, not yours. In other words, you're not going to do what you do for them so you, can, so you can have a trophy to hang on the wall and get up and brag in front of people about what you've done, right? No, you're not interested in trophies and, and you know, accolades. What you're doing, you're doing it out of a sincere heart. There's that word again, Pilate said, what is truth? You know what he was saying? He is saying, is there really anything called altruism? Remember me mentioning that word to you the other day? What is altruism? It means that when the person does what they do, they do it out of a sincere, clean, pure motive because that is the point, the object of their life, of their ministry, of whatever they're doing for no personal gain, no recognition. That's altruism. And when Christ came into the world, he didn't come to be glorified. God took care of that part. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He subjected himself to Joseph and his mother. He chose to do that. This is what the Lord Jesus did. He did it. He did it because that was the servant of the Lord. And I mean, the typology of the servant of the book of Isaiah lays down some of the groundwork for the kind of servant the Lord Jesus Christ was. And there never walked on this earth a greater servant than our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything he did, he did it for someone else, not for himself. Bless his righteous name. I could shout and say his name for a million years. And I, wouldn't have, I haven't begun. If God just takes me to heaven and turns me loose, I'll go up one street and down the other. Run across the river, the, the river of life and I'll be praising the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's how I got there. The son of God didn't earn one bit of it, didn't deserve one moment of it, wasn't good enough to be saved. Not one thing could I take, could I take any credit for. And tonight I can take credit for nothing. He did it all. <laughs> he did it all for me. Pure motive. The motive cannot be more pure than what he did. He gave himself for me. He said, therefore, I am the way. The what? And the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So consider yourself. Consider yourself. When you see some poor old soul wallowing around, falling down, victim to their own choices that they've made, and their life now is nothing but a terrible, horrible misery, another day of hell on this earth. You know, don't look down at them. Look at him with compassion. And God may give you the kind of heart you need because it may be that that's all they need is one friend. One person who cares. You know, David said, no man careth for my soul. That's a wonderful thing to know that somebody cares. Somebody cares. Does somebody care? Do you care? It says that murder is one of those Fruits of the, uh, the uh, works of the flesh. Could a Christian commit murder? Sure they can. Yes, they can. They can commit it. They can commit it. Can God forgive murder? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. He can forgive murder. I don't know whether 
we could forgive murder. I'd have to have the grace of God. If somebody broke into my house and shot my family dead, I wouldn't be one of these pious ones to get on the next day on TV and say, well, you know, bless the Lord. It's just the way things go. And we're taught to serve the Lord and, and never question God. Well, maybe that's the way you can handle it. I wouldn't. I'd probably be stomping around mad. I'm into telling you, i find out who the devil that did it and want to swing him from a yard arm. But uh, the truth of the matter is, God's the final judge, isn't he? I mean, after all, do you remember, you remember what Jonah said to the Lord? Do you remember what he said to him? He said, I told you. God said, now I want you to go to Nineveh and you preach to that bunch over there. He said, I don't know the right hand from the left. The enemy, that's the capital of, of, of Syria, of their enemy. And, and, and Jonah wasn't too excited about that. And then Jonah reminded the Lord later when the Holy Ghost began to move. He said, I told you. <laughs> I told you. I know you. I know what you do. When you get around sinners, you soften up. <laughs> that's what he was saying. He said, there just seems to be something in your heart that a sinner can touch that righteous people can't. And the Lord said, Job, you got me figured out, son. That's how you made it. And that's how all the rest of them will make it. Because there is a soft spot in my heart for sinners. There is. I'm not talking about my heart. I'm talking about him speaking of himself first person. Yes, the Lord has a soft spot in his heart for sinners. Are you a sinner? Well, of course. Well, preacher, you know I'm going to tell you the truth now. I just, I just believe in shucking the corn. All right, go ahead. I've asked the Lord to forgive me four or five times for the same sin. And I'm sure he's getting tired of it. No, he's not tired of it. How many times did he say you could forgive somebody in one day? Seventy times seven, right? And I'm not a math whiz. Multiply that seven times seventy. What do we got? That's exactly right. That's a bunch of times. 490 times in one day. Amen. You say, well, I just keep doing the same thing. All right. He'll forgive you. And if you listen to him, he'll show you how to get victory over it. And if you listen to him, he'll show you how to walk with him. If you, <laughs> if you listen to him, he'll really will. He'll walk with you. He'll always walk. He always wants to walk with you. If you just listen to him. And then he will draw you close to him. And then he'll draw himself. He'll draw nigh to thee. Father, bless your word. Help us tonight. God, we know this old man. I know Charles Lawson. Know him real good. Oh, yeah, I know him. <laughs> yeah, I know him. I know him real good. But I also know you. And I know what happened to me in 1973. And I know how my life changed. Thanks be unto God. There may be somebody in the house tonight beat to death, beat to death, run to death. They're just about ready to quit and give up. Help them tonight to know, Lord, that you're long-suffering to usward. Long-suffering. Way after man has given up and quit, you're still going on. Going right on. I pray for that sinner tonight. May they come to you. May they come back once again now. May they come back. And this time, take a little closer step. Learn just a little more. Sweeter fellowship than they ever had before. Forgiveness and cleansing and feel that weight lifted off their soul. And have the joy come back in their heart. Oh, there's nothing like it. There's no substitute for it. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, let's stand up in here tonight. I hope.